Hi. In this video, we're going to be looking at the two-factor theory of emotion as investigated by Stanley Schachter and Jerome E. Singer in 1962. This study is quite a complex one, so I recommend that you watch the video all the way through and then go back to the beginning and watch it again, stopping to make notes as you go along. Moving on. In this course, the Schachter and Singer study falls under the biological approach, which assumes that our thoughts, feelings, and behavior have biological causes, and that these causes can be studied physiologically. In other words, that behavior can be understood through the roles of genetics, hormones, and brain function. Before we go into the Schachter and Singer study proper, I'd like to look at six of the terms that we'll be meeting. You may already know them, but let's be sure. First of all, the term physiological. This is about ways in which our bodies function. So for instance, your heart beating, your digestion taking place, your breathing, these are all physiological things. And the next word is stimulus. A stimulus is something that you see, hear, smell, and so on. Sometimes that stimulus evokes a physical reaction, like when you hear a sudden loud bang and your heart starts beating fast. Then we have the word cognition. And put really simply, Cognition means thinking. It's the way our brains process information. The next word is arousal. Now, we're not talking about arousal in the sexual sense here. In psychology, arousal is the state of being physiologically stimulated and alert. And it may include things like increased breathing and heart rates, perspiration and tremor. So when you hear that loud bang, that I mentioned a moment ago, your heart beating fast is arousal and it's caused by your autonomic nervous system. And this autonomic nervous system is that part of you that functions outside conscious thought or effort. So when you hear that loud bang, your autonomic nervous system releases adrenaline, which makes your heart beat fast amongst other things. It's to mobilize your body for action, should it be necessary. The sixth word I'd like to define is emotion. Emotion is a strong feeling or mood. We tend to use words such as happiness, sadness, fear, anger, etc. to describe our emotions. Now let's look at some background to the Schachter and Singer study. Up until the late 1950s, Theories of emotion were based on physiological factors only. And it was thought that the experience of an emotion happened at the same time as the physiological response to a stimulus. So you hear a loud bang, your heart beats fast, and that's the emotion labeled fear. But then in 1959, Stanley Schachter proposed the two-factor theory of emotion which postulates that emotion is the result of both physiological and psychological components together. Put another way, the two-factor theory of emotion looks at the interaction between physical arousal and how we cognitively label that arousal. So the thinking is that in order to feel an emotion, we have to both experience the arousal and identify or label it. So you hear a loud bang, your heart beats fast, you think, I'm in danger, and therefore you experience the emotion fear. So arousal plus cognition equals emotion. I've briefly mentioned adrenaline, a hormone that our autonomic nervous systems release in response to a flight, fight or freeze situation. 
It's part of the way this system readies us to cope with an emergency. Now, if a person is injected with adrenaline, it produces basically the same symptoms as when the autonomic nervous system releases adrenaline in response to a stressful situation. And with this knowledge, Schachter suggested that if adrenaline was administered to a subject without them knowing about it, the subject would be aware of the effects such as palpitations, tremor, perspiration, face flushing, etc., which are also associated with a discharge of the autonomic nervous system. And that subject would then try to understand why they were feeling this way and would then label their symptoms accordingly. And they would do that in terms of their knowledge of the immediate situation. Let's look at an example. Imagine a man who's been given a shot of adrenaline, but he doesn't know it. He thinks it was a vitamin injection. A beautiful woman walks into the room where he is. His heart's beating, his face is flushed, he trembles slightly. Based on these symptoms, he thinks, I'm in love, or something like that. This emotion has come about because the symptoms he's experiencing, together with the circumstances, that's the presence of the beautiful woman, lead him through cognition to label his feelings as the emotion love. Now, in the same circumstances, if the man knew he'd been given adrenaline, he might surmise that the symptoms he was experiencing weren't due to the presence of the beautiful woman, but to the known effects of adrenaline. Therefore, he would not look for any further reasons as to the cause of his arousal. In other words, no cognition, no emotion. Well, that's how it's supposed to work anyway. What about this example? There are two people arguing. One has been given adrenaline, but she doesn't know it. She experiences the effects of the adrenaline and given the circumstances, flies into an emotional rage. If she'd known about the adrenaline, she probably would have put the symptoms down to its effects and kept her temper. This line of thought then leads to the following hypotheses. Given a state of physiological arousal for which an individual has no immediate explanation, they will both label this state, that is, say what it is, and describe their feelings in terms of the cognitions available to them. Here's an example. My heart is pounding. I'm trembling, but I don't know why. What can be the cause? Hmm. I felt like this once when I was sick, so maybe I'm getting sick. Hypothesis number two. If someone is physiologically aroused and they have an appropriate explanation for that arousal, no further cognition is necessary and the individual is unlikely to label their feelings in terms of any other available reasons. An example. My heart is pounding and I'm trembling but I know that this is because I've just received an injection of adrenaline. So I don't look for any other reason. Or this example, my heart is pounding and I'm trembling. I know that this is because there is a knife wielding man approaching. Reason explained. And I don't look for an alternative. Hypothesis number three, consider this. Someone experiences stimuli which from a logical standpoint indicates that they're in great danger, but for some reason unknown to them, perhaps drug or surgically related, their autonomic nervous system remains, remains inactive and they don't experience a state of physiological arousal. No rapid heartbeat, no hot flush, nothing. In this situation, do they experience the emotion fear? Here's a simple but abnormal illustration. A knife-wielding man approaches you. Cognitively, you know you are in danger. 
but you don't experience any adrenaline effects. Do you experience the emotion fear? Well, if the two-factor theory is correct and emotion results from physiological arousal together with appropriate cognition, then you would say you did not experience fear in those circumstances. Now let's look at how Schachter and Singer tested the two-factor theory. We begin with the sampling technique, which was self-selecting. The details. They used 184 participants. These participants were volunteers who'd agreed to be part of a pool of participants who could be invited to take part in this or any other study. Actually, there were 185 participants, but one withdrew because he didn't want the injection. They were all students taking introductory psychology. They were all white and all male. And they were given two extra points on their final examination for participating. And the method? It was a laboratory experiment with observation and self-report questionnaires. More details about that shortly. The 184 participants were split randomly into four groups. And these in turn were each divided into two subgroups each participant experiencing only one condition of the IV, independent variable. So the design was independent measures. This to obviate demand characteristics, of course. Demand characteristics, that is, if a participant were to repeat any of the conditions, they'd immediately understand what was going on in the experiment and they might respond falsely. Now, because of the number of different conditions, this is where things get a bit complex. To begin with, we'll just think of the four main conditions or groups, and the subgroups will come later. So, to the first one. The participants in this group were labeled EPINF, standing for Epinephrine Informed. We'll see what this means in a minute. At the beginning of the experiment, the participant was taken to a private room and told that the study was a test of vision, together with the vitamin supplement Suproxen. If the participant agreed to do the study, a short while later, a doctor arrived and gave an injection of Suproxen. But there was no such thing as a drug called Suproxen. And in fact, the, the participant was given an injection of epinephrine, which is synthesized adrenaline. Even though the participant thought he was receiving suproxen, the doctor accurately informed him of the side effects he was likely to experience. That is, increased rates of breathing and heartbeat, tremor, perspiration, etc. Hence, the EPINF label for this condition because even though they didn't know they were getting epinephrine, they were accurately informed about the possible side effects that they were going to experience. Okay, we're going to leave the EPINF participants for the moment and look at participants from another of the four groups. And this condition was labeled EPIMIS, which stood for epinephrine misinformed. And here's why. As before, the participant was taken to a private room and told that the study was a test of vision and the vitamin supplement Suproxen. Also as before, the doctor arrived and gave an injection which she said was Suproxen, but which was epinephrine. So no difference so far. However, this time, the doctor misinformed the participants about the side effects, telling them that they might experience numbness in the feet, have an itching sensation over parts of their body, and a slight headache. This information was, of course, completely false. Hence the EPIMIS designation, standing for epinephrine misinformed. Now to a third condition, the EPI-IGN group, 
EPIGN standing for Epinephrine Ignorant. To begin with, the procedure was the same as for the previous two conditions, with the participants being given epinephrine under the guise of suproxen. Except this time, the doctor didn't mention any side effects at all. Therefore, they were ignorant of any possible side effects. And the fourth group, this was a control condition where the participants were told the same things as those in the EPIGN group that we've just looked at. But instead of receiving epinephrine, they were injected with a saline solution in the guise of suproxen. In other words, a placebo. Right, now that we've looked at the four main conditions, let's examine them with their subgroups. Here we have the four main conditions each of which manipulate the physiological component. So we have epinephrine informed, epinephrine misinformed, epinephrine ignorant, and the placebo. And the subgroups labeled euphoria and anger, which manipulated the participant's psychological or cognitive component. There was no anger condition for EPI-MIS, because this group was originally designed as a control condition. So it was thought that having the EPI-MIS participants in the euphoria condition would be adequate to evaluate the possible effects of receiving misinformation about the side effects of the injection. Now, if you're struggling a bit with the euphoria and anger terminology, it, it will become clear in a moment. Scientifically speaking, in this experiment, there were two independent variables which resulted in seven different conditions. The first independent variable, or IV, concerned the participant's understanding about the effects of the injection he was given, whether he was informed, misinformed, or ignorant. The second IV was the situation that the participants were placed in after the injection, whether euphoria or anger. And as we've seen, there was also a control group. Then there were two measures of the dependent variable or DV, one of which was observation through a one-way mirror and the other answers from the participants to a self-report questionnaire. Let's see what took place starting with the participants in the euphoria subgroup. Having been given the injection and told the side effects, the, the participant was told to wait in a room for 20 minutes, ostensibly for the effects of the injection to kick in before the vision tests began. Also in the room was another young male who was introduced as a fellow participant. However, this other person was in fact a confederate or stooge, in other words, who would act out in a certain standardized routine. And that routine was to imitate the effects of a euphoric state. In other words, super happy. Just to mention here that the stooge did not know which of the four conditions each participant was in. And that's called a double blind technique and it helps to improve the, the validity of the data collected. The stooge, playing his part, doodled, played basketball with crumpled pieces of paper and a waste basket, played with a hula hoop, made and flew paper aeroplanes and built and knocked down a tower of folders. All the time, he kept up a light-hearted commentary, occasionally inviting the real participant to join in. While this was taking place, the participant was being covertly observed through a one-way mirror. For each unit of the stooge's standardized routine, the observer noted what the participant did and said, and coded his behavior in one or more of the following categories. Category 1 joins in the activity. Category 2 initiates new activity. Categories three and four were ignores stooge, 
and watches Stooge. Because the observers gathered their data without the knowledge of the participants, and so were unable to be influenced by the participants, and their observation criteria were standardized, the data gathered by them were objective. To test the reliability of the coding, two observers independently assessed two experimental sessions, and there was complete agreement on the coding of 88% of the units. So inter-rater reliability was good. Now to the anger condition. The stooge again acted according to a standardized script and again did not know to which condition each participant had been assigned. As with the euphoria condition, immediately after the injection, the experimenter brought the stooge into the participant's room, introduced the two, and after explaining why a 20 minute delay was necessary, asked them to use the time to answer a questionnaire. As soon as the experimenter left the room, the stooge began to complain about having to have an injection and about the length of the questionnaire. The questions began by asking basic information, but became progressively more insulting, including requesting explicit information about topics such as personal hygiene and the participant's sex life. And all the while, the stooge kept pace with the participant as he answered the questions, whilst pretending to make increasingly more angry comments. Finally, the stooge ripped up his questionnaire, crumpled the pieces and threw them on the floor before stamping out of the room. Thereafter, there were eight more questions, the final one being, with how many men other than your father has your mother had extramarital relationships? For each of the units of stooge behavior, an observer recorded the participants' responses according to six categories. And here they are. Category one, agrees. Category two, disagrees. Category three, neutral. Category four, initiates agreement or disagreement and category five, watches. Category six, ignores. At the end of the 20 minutes, in both the euphoria and anger conditions, the participants were asked to fill in a structured self-report. It contained some inconsequential closed questions, as well as some that were relevant to the experiment. To measure the physical effects of epinephrine, and determine whether or not the injection had been successful in producing the necessary bodily state, these questions were asked. Pause the video to read them. To measure possible effects of the instructions in the EPMIS condition, three questions were asked. One, did you feel any numbness in your feet? Two, did you feel any itching sensation? And three, did you experience any feeling of headache and remember they were told that they would they were going to experience those um, side effects but in fact it was false to all three of these questions was attached a four point scale as previously running from not at all to an intense amount in addition to the closed questions the participants answered two open-ended questions on other physical or emotional sensations they might have experienced. An additional measure of bodily state was pulse rate, which was taken by the physician or the experimenter at two times, immediately before the injection and immediately after the session with the stooge. After the questionnaires had been filled in, the experimenter explained the deception and the reasons for it in detail, answered any questions, and swore the subjects to secrecy so that future runs of the experiment would not be jeopardized or compromised. Finally, the subjects answered a brief questionnaire about their experiences, if any, with adrenaline and their previous knowledge or suspicion of the experimental setup. 
11 participants were so extremely suspicious of an important part of the experiment that their data were automatically discarded. Before we go to the results, let's look briefly at the hypotheses for each of the four main conditions which manipulated the physiological component. The epi-INF participants were told the effects of epinephrine, so in theory, they should not copy the behavior of the stooge. The epi-MIS participants were misinformed about epinephrine, so to seek an explanation for why they felt like they did, they should identify with the behavior of the stooge. The epi-IGN participants were told nothing about epinephrine. So as for the epi-MIS group, it was hypothesized that they would look for an explanation and therefore identify with the behavior of the stooge. And the participants in the placebo group who were not given epinephrine and therefore experienced no arousal and were told nothing should in theory not identify with the behavior of the stooge. On to the findings. In both the euphoria and anger conditions, there was an increase in pulse rate in those who had received epinephrine, compared with a decrease in pulse rate in the control group who had received the placebo. This difference between the adrenaline and placebo conditions is significant. Looking at the self-report measures, participants injected with epinephrine also reported higher scores for palpitations and tremors than those in the control group, indicating that they were having a behavioral response to the increased levels of arousal. So, to the conclusions, all three hypotheses were supported. So the findings of the study provide experimental evidence for the two-factor theory of emotion. The misinformed participants in the euphoria condition felt happier than all the others. The second happiest group was the ignorant group. This shows that these participants were more susceptible to the stooge because they had no explanation for their symptoms. The informed group felt the least happy because they understood why they felt as they did. In the anger condition, the ignorant group felt the angriest. The second angriest group was the control group, whilst the least angry group was those who were informed. Again, this shows that these participants were more susceptible to the stooge because they had no explanation for their symptoms. Now let's evaluate the study in terms of strengths and weaknesses. To begin with, the use of stooges or confederates was technically unethical because they deceived the participants. On the other hand, this study couldn't have been done in, in a laboratory setting without the use of stooges. And they did debrief the participants afterwards, so that's a strength. Also, it could be said that the stooges were leading the participants to act in ways which they wouldn't normally behave. Rather, they were being encouraged to behave in ways that had been predetermined by the experimenter. So from this point of view, it could be said that the study lacked mundane realism. Concerning the participants in the study, they were volunteers, which is a strength. But the fact that they were all male, ethnically white, paid for participating, and students in a narrow age band could be construed as a weakness regarding generalizability. One strength of the study is that it employed many controls to try to ensure that the dependent variable was in fact caused by the independent variable and not by extraneous variables. Also a strength is that Schachter and Singer gathered quantitative data through observations and through structured questionnaires about the participants' emotional and physiological states. In addition, they asked two open-ended questions on other physical or emotional sensations, which provided qualitative data. 
Right, that's the overview of the study. Now I recommend that you look at past papers to get an idea of the sort of questions that you might be asked. Good luck.